let me welcome you all to the third uh, meeting of the joint Brown Harvard MIT seminar on South Asian politics this semester. I'm Ashutosh Varshne um, at Brown, and um, our speaker today, um, our main presenter today, is Susan Osterman, who is an assistant professor of global affairs and political science at the University of Notre Dame. I've known Susan's work since her PhD days at Berkeley. Her work stands at the intersection of law and politics. Uh, her, her, she has a law degree from Stanford Law and then a PhD in political science from Berkeley. And um, she seeks to understand why um, we sometimes as human beings, as citizens comply uh, in comply with regulations in very unlikely places, places where states are weak and people are not literate enough to understand uh, the law and bureaucrats are self-interested and they apply the law uh, capriciously and often in their own interest rather than in the interests of the state. Um, her work has been published in Asian Survey, uh, Studies in Comparative International Development, which comes out of, uh, of Watson Institute at Brown and other two issues, and then it moves somewhere else. Uh, the Journal of Race, Ethnicity and Politics, Studies in Indian Politics and Law and Policy. And her presentation today is based on her manuscript, uh, which is being reviewed uh, for publication. The title is Capacity Beyond Coercion, Regulatory Pragmatism, and Compliance Across the India-Nepal Border. Um, uh, Arun Agarwal is uh, a, a longtime student of uh, community-based conservation and uh, forests and environmental identities, will be a commentator, and, and I'll introduce him after Susan has completed her presentation. So Susan, uh, go right ahead. Okay, give me a second to get these slides up. I'm actually not, despite a year of doing this, I'm not terribly accustomed to presenting from my home computer and I'm quite mm. used to the, the big screen, multi-screen show that we have at Notre Dame. But I think I've got it. Can everybody see? Yeah. All right, perfect. Um, so thank you for the kind introduction and invitation to speak with all of you today. I'm so glad to see many of you since we can't um, actually see each other uh, on campus. I want to thank Aaron in advance for serving as my discussant. I couldn't ask for a better one. Um, and I suppose it goes without saying perhaps that I would prefer to be present with all of you rather than on Zoom, but uh, those days will be here soon enough and before we know it, we'll be complaining about travel again. So without further ado, uh, capacity beyond coercion. Today I'm going to explore the limits of the state's ability to ensure compliance with its laws but also the largely unexplored capacities that allow coercively weak states to promote law following behavior, as Ashu in indicated in the introduction. Even well institutionalized and coercively strong states cannot use enforcement alone to achieve large scale compliance. Resource constraints and political factors often force them to prioritize among different legal projects. When the state is coercively weak, as is the case in much of the developing world, this prioritization becomes extreme. As a result, many such states use enforcement for only the most basic regulatory tasks, and they often fail even at this. These failures have led us to believe that the key to achieving widespread compliance and rule of law is enhanced state capacity, something we have historically struggled to define, let alone promote. In this talk, I'm going to argue that we are not wrong to focus on state capacity, but we have largely been too narrowly focused in how we understand the term. The very fact that coercively weak states sometimes achieve widespread compliance with regu regulatory projects that are a priori challenging and unpopular 
suggests that states have capacities to achieve regulatory compliance beyond those involving coercion. Now take, for example, the cases of India and Nepal. When I observationally examine compliance rates with similar wood collection prohibitions in place in two contiguous national parks located on opposite sides of the border, I find significant cross-border variation in compliance despite the fact that both states are at least locally. And I say that very specifically because we're talking about the south of Nepal and about Bihar here. They're at least locally weak. And I'll even frame that further to say that they were locally weak, especially at the time that I conducted the field research, which was 2013 and 2014. There have been significant improvements. Now, when I visited the India Nepal border in June of 2011, I found a steady stream of people going into Balmiki National Park and Tiger Reserve. And that's the picture you see behind me or to the left of me. Um, and coming out having collected fallen wood. They were doing so despite the fact that collecting wood in the national park is illegal. This non-compliance was not surprising, however. I knew that people living near, near these parks are poor and rely on fuel wood for cooking and heating. I also knew they had been sourcing their fuel wood for centuries in a forest area that had only recently been dubbed a park. Thus, their behavior conformed to my expectations for an area that, unlike some other parts of India, was weakly institutionalized and suffered from low state coercive capacity. When the state and its institutions are weak, and when people are poor, need firewood, and have been getting it from ages from a particular place, we have very little reason to expect them to stop doing so. In contrast, in Nepal, a place some have argued is a failed state, at least in the past, it's looking a little bit better now, few people go into Chitwan National Park to collect wood. Now the data you see behind me come from an observational study. Hopefully, ooh, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, I had two different individuals posted in very similar locations on either side of the border on one of the main roads leading to the relevant park. So one each for Chitwan and one for Balmiki. And I had these individuals count for four hours in the afternoon the number of people coming out of the park with wood. They did so, as you can see from the data, on 25 randomly selected days over three months. The cross-border differences are stark. You can see them with the naked eye. Given that both states are weak, at least locally, why do we see variation in compliance? I argue that more accurate legal knowledge fostered by regulatory pragmatism, a concept I will introduce later on, explains the surprising cross-border variation in compliance. First, however, I'll explain the empirical puzzle at the heart of this project, explore the current state of the literature as briefly as possible, and demonstrate why it does not adequately explain this puzzle, and then the design I chose in order to do so. I'll then present data drawn from five novel data sets um, that were developed through three large end surveys, one field experiment, and 37 in-depth interviews, and I'll add a partridge and a pear tree. Um, afterward, I'll introduce the concept of regulatory pragmatism, as I mentioned, and show using shadow cases that this variable explains the surprising successes the Indian and Nepali states enjoyed in different regulatory contexts, with bringing about widespread rule following behavior in the absence of significant coercive capacity. Finally, I'll address a major counter argument, poverty, and demonstrate that regulatory pragmatism also helps explain why the poor sometimes comply with laws that run counter to their self interest. Okay, let's start with the broad empirical puzzle. So South Asian states are quite diverse in terms of regime type and institutions, although that is consolidating more these days. Um, they all seem to struggle to foster compliance with law. This is apparent in the rampant practices of tax evasion, corruption, disruption of public order, bribery, et cetera. Oops, and I'm on the wrong slide. Um, it is tempting to explain this away as numerous others have by claiming that culture, poverty, venal politicians and bureaucrats are to blame. Yet compliance with laws and particularly laws that um, differ from cultural norms does exist across South Asia. If the existing literature is adequate, why do we see compliance with the law in areas where we would expect it least? Now, given the arbitrary nature of the Indian-Nepal border, and given that standard explanations for the lack of compliance found throughout South Asia do not vary at this boundary, we should expect to see similar rates of compliance with similar regulations along it. But that's not what I found during my nearly two years of field research in this area. 
fact, in the first case I looked at involving the same conservation regulation employed in two contiguous national parks that lie on opposite sides of the border, I found that compliance was significantly higher in Nepal. In another case involving nearly identical teacher-student regulations governing private schools in twin border cities, I found that compliance was higher in India. Meanwhile, in a third case involving compliance with the same child labor regulation in brick kilns located within 10 kilometers of the India-Nepal border, I found no difference in compliance as I moved from one country to the next. The literature suggests that this type of variation should not exist, that as long as all else is held constant, compliance should be low when and where coercive capacity is low. Now, a good place to start in terms of trying to understand cross-border variation in compliance when culture, poverty, and corruption have been taken off the table is the socio-legal compliance literature. According to the standard deterrence model, three main factors drive compliance with law, fear, duty, and social license pressures. Then of course, there are other factors which can augment the power of these basic three to motivate compliance. The problem with using deter the deterrence model as a guide for predicting behavior along the Indian Nepal border is that while people do fear the state in the abstract, they often end up breaking specific laws anyway. This fact points to a problem in the socio-legal compliance literature itself, namely that it generally relies on strongly institutionalized cases, places where, co excuse me, places where coercive capacity is significant and legal knowledge is present. We know that in the many places where non-compliance is common, coercive capacity is also limited. Thus, it is not surprising that the literature is focused on this admittedly important connection, sometimes to the exclusion of a related, but not necessarily dependent variable, the accuracy of legal knowledge. Now, the literature largely assumes that the law is widely known and understood. This assumption, however, I'll submit to you, is as problematical as the now discredited assumption of perfect information in economics. Few truly know what the law requires, and you can think to yourself, how often do I actually know exactly what's required in a particular situation by the law? I argue that the failure of deterrence in areas of state weakness isn't necessarily driven by the state's inability to project force and deter violations, but instead by its inability to communicate legal norms to those targeted by them. These are separate skills. So how does the state transmit information about the law? Typically in one of three ways, through printed materials, which work fairly well so long as you can read and have an education, through experts like lawyers or uh, staff at NGOs or things like this, um, other interested parties as well, or through the consistent actions and communications of its agents. Now, in areas of state weakness, the state's communication problem is complex. Poor, uneducated populations struggle to learn about the law themselves, either by reading or by seeking expert advice. As a result, many learn about the law by observing the state. As in the economics literature, where the behavior of market actors is seen to be a primary source of information, the behavior of the state is also considered to be excellent evidence of the underlying laws and norms the state is trying to enforce by those who are actually trying to figure this out. The problem here is that the state communicates through people bureaucrats for the most part, and in areas of state weakness, the state struggles to get bureaucrats to behave consistently. This is the classical principal agent problem, and it presents a significant barrier to compliance. If individuals observe bureaucrats behaving erratically, they struggle to learn about the law. Thus, any state that suffers even locally from low education levels, a lack of competent lawyers, and principal agent problems is likely to be plagued by inaccurate legal knowledge. If such a state nevertheless hopes to communicate legal norms to relevant target populations, it must design regulations and implementation strategies with information transmission in mind. Now let's take a close look at Nepal. The Nepali state has done little to inform individuals about wood collection prohibitions in place in Chupan National Park. And what you see in the slide is a sign posted at the entry to that park. There are many along the border to it. I contrast it with a sign posted at the entry to a city park near where I used to live in San Francisco. The latter conveys quite a bit of information about the law. The former does not. So how do individuals living in this region find out about the law? Education is limited and lawyers are expensive and hard to find. 
But when I spoke to individuals about their knowledge of legal requirements, I found that they do not passively wait for information. Instead, they are consummate observers of the state, whether directly or via their acquaintances, and they regularly update their legal understandings to reflect new information. I'll tell you a short illustrative anecdote. Uh, one day while I was conducting field work, I was going to the National Park headquarters, to Chitwan National Park headquarters, and was walking across a bridge to do so, a bridge that has guards on it. I looked to the side of the bridge and I saw a gentleman down the way fishing in the river. This kind of amused me because fishing in the river was illegal. Um, and I thought I would go talk to him. So I went down the way and I said to him, you're fishing here, are you allowed to do that? And he said to me that he was. And I said, oh, okay, how do you know? And he said, I've been doing it my whole life. I said, okay, great. Um, then he admitted to me, and this was really quite interesting. He said, ah, but a couple of my friends did get into trouble for fishing from the bridge that I had just been crossing, which was in full view of the park headquarters. So I said, how do you reconcile this information? If they got into trouble there, but it's fine for you here. And he said, that's easy, that the river and the fish within it belong to God and anybody can take them, but the bridge belongs to the government and therefore the government can prohibit fishing from the bridge. Now, of course, this is a self-serving understanding of the law that he has come to, but I do think that he was trying to figure out exactly what the law was and fit his observations together in his mind based on what he was able to observe. Now, if a state rarely or selectively enforces a particular regulation, misunderstandings can develop quite quickly. And this is exactly what is happening outside Chitwan on Valmiki, or I should say used to be happening. I have not been there in the last two years, unfortunately. Um, the states on both sides of the border by their own admissions have not intended to engage in large scale enforcement of or taking prohibition. Meanwhile, individual bureaucrats do occasionally enforce these rules. The result is widespread misunderstandings of the law, and this default is present among individuals on both sides of the border. It follows that consistent state action was, would result in more accurate legal knowledge. The more a state enforces a particular regulation, the more likely it is that individuals will see the state doing so, either directly or through their acquaintances, and conclude that a given activity, a punished activity, is prohibited. But states that suffer from principal agent problems simply can't achieve this level of consistency. This is where pra regulatory pragmatism can help. So what is it? I've been talking about it. I've been using this word a bunch. I followed James and the more recent legal pragmatists to say that regulatory pragmatism is a flexible rather than legally doctrinaire or dogmatic approach to the design and implementation of a regulatory system that is specifically adapted for the context in, will, in which regulation will occur. It prizes effectiveness and durability over all other goals and typically takes into account on the ground realities of state capacity, the irregular behavior of state agents and the needs of populations targeted by particular regulations. I hypothesize that states that employ strategies consistent with regulatory pragmatism will realize higher rates of compliance than those that do not. And more specifically, I hypothesize that states that have low state coercive capacity, but which nevertheless design for legal knowledge transmission, will realize more accurate legal knowledge and higher rates of compliance. So how might the state design around principal agent problems to foster legal knowledge transmission? Delegation of state regulatory responsibilities to individuals, businesses, or organizations allows communities to get involved in and take ownership of regulatory processes. This allows communities to create consistent enforcement in places in which the state itself struggles to do so. Enterprising locals do the work of informing other locals about legal norms and ensuring compliance with them. A look at one pragmatic regulatory strategy is illuminating. Community forests present in Nepal and absent, at least around Balmiki in India at the time of research, are forms of delegated regulation in which the state has allowed a user group from the community to take over part of a government owned forest. User groups can sustainably collect wood in community forests and as can others living near them, but they must maintain forest cover and obey a number of other rules which are generally enforced by the community. If the rules are not obeyed, the government can take the forest 
There are many community forests, 50 plus at last count, just outside of Chitwan National Park. Now, India does have an analogous program. It's called Joint Forest Management. And while it has been quite successful in various parts of India, it is not in place outside of Balmiki, or was not, I should say, at the time of research. They have been dabbling with it more recently. Now, it makes sense that community forests, um, or it makes sense that access to a community forest might foster accurate knowledge about community forest rules, but it's not clear how locals might learn about national park law. I argue that this can happen in at least two ways, through observation of contrasting norms or through dissemination by way of a local leader. I'll tackle the observation first. Um, so as some locals start to take wood from community forests, others are able to observe them doing so and a new norm starts to form. When it appears as if people can regularly take wood out of community forests without consequence, individuals are presented with contrasting observations. This is essentially the setup for cognitive dissonance in the psych literature. Some people do get into trouble for taking wood out of the national park, but no one gets into trouble with the government anyway for taking wood out of the community forest that lies right next to it. As individuals who live near community forests update their legal understandings, this contrast helps them to update in a way that is more accurate than those who just observe haphazard enforcement in the national park. The second route, dissemination by local leaders is in many ways easier. Local leaders, because they are trustworthy and are perceived to have connections of the, to the state, regardless of whether they are elected officials or not, have the power to turn a rumor, what is essentially a rumor about the law into something a bit more believable, even actionable. The India-Nepal border provides us with an opportunity to determine whether legal knowledge can in fact be transmitted in these two different matters. Such opportunities are really quite rare in law where experimental designs are difficult to pull off for logistical and obviously for ethical reasons. Now, the same people live on both sides of the border in this area, or let's just say it's relatively um, equal on both sides and my balance table suggests it is. In other words, they belong to the same dominant ethnic group and speak the same set of languages in a roughly equal proportion. Poverty is widespread, corruption is pervasive. In both places, the state is largely absent. So this is changing now. Um, Nepalese and Indians can cross the border freely, except during COVID. Um, they need no documentation to cross. They also shop, work, and even marry across the border. So much so that the riots that happened in this area in 2015, at least on the Nepali side, were driven in part by the citizenship definition of Nepal's new constitution and the degree to which uh, it excluded many who marry across the border from a number of different rights. For all intents and purposes then, people living in this region are only notionally Indian and Nepali. This is no surprise. I learned through archival research at the British Library that this border, unlike most political boundaries within India or within Nepal, was drawn arbitrarily back in 1860. There is, however, one key difference. Use of a state strategy consistent with regulatory pragmatism. The states on either side of the border have largely adopted the same basic rule. In the case of the forest, this is a prohibition on wood collection in the national park but they've gone about implementing that rule in very different manners. The border design allows me to control for everything but this one difference and then to examine and explain the circumstances under which states with limited coercive capacity can still ensure compliance with their laws. So what did I do? I conducted a large end survey of over 1300 respondents, randomly sampling villages within walking distance of the parks and conducting quasi random convenience samples, right hand rule within each village. I also collected a number of in-depth interviews, both before and after the quantitative data collection. Finally, I conducted a field experiment to test whether legal knowledge can be effectively transmitted or disseminated by local leaders. This experiment also allowed me to replicate my findings from the larger end portion of the project. So how did I measure my main variables? I measured legal knowledge by reading a series of statements to my respondents you see a list of them on the slide. Before doing so, however, I asked respondents whether they used fuel wood and where they sourced it. I did so at the very beginning of the survey without telling them what the survey was about. So this was something that people actually felt very comfortable reporting. 
I used the responses to measure compliance. And so I would say, where do you, where do you get your food? And they would gesture and say, oh, right over there at the park or at the community forest or both, or I buy it, or I get it from my neighbor or what have you. I measured exposure, exposure to regulatory pragmatism by asking respondents whether they had access to a community forest. So subjectively, whether they could access this strategy. So what did I find? My data suggests that cross-border variation in compliance can be explained by variation in the accuracy of legal knowledge. As you can see, the percentage of respondents with accurate legal knowledge is significantly higher in Nepal than it is in India. This is important because legal knowledge is crucial for compliance in all those situations in which the law differs from cultural norms. This would be an entirely different project if the law and the cultural norms or social norms coincided. Indeed, I find that legal knowledge is associated with higher rates of compliance at every level of aggregation. So as you can see for the entire study region, for Nepal, for India, and for the replication villages, which were entirely with Nepal, the same, the same basic principle applies. If individuals do not know what the law is, they cannot make a conscious decision to comply with it. It is also important because the literature largely assumes that legal knowledge is present, as I mentioned earlier. Now, my data indicate that those who have been exposed to a strategy consistent with regulatory pragmatism are significantly more likely to hold an accurate understanding of the law that wood collection in the national park is prohibited than those who have not been exposed. The state strategy in question, as discussed earlier, involved the creation of community forests. Community forests allow individuals to learn about the law through observation of contrast. In this case, contrast between the state's behavior in the national park and the behavior of the state's delegates in the community forests located just outside that national park. I verify this finding, as you can see on the slide, by comparing those who have been exposed to regulatory pragmatism both across the border, so across the Indian-Nepal border, and within Nepal, which is the rightmost data, to alleviate any nagging concerns about the methodological efficacy of the border design. So two ways in which this works. Next, I test the proposition that local leaders can effectively disseminate information about the law. To do so, I conducted a field experiment in which I measured legal knowledge of national park laws in three villages located just outside of the national park. I then engaged in an intervention in three of them, oh, sorry, in two of them designed to foster accurate legal knowledge. In the first, I, I distributed a flyer along with a local leader that contained information about national park laws to 40 individuals. In the second, I had a local leader convey the same information in an interactive session with about 40 individuals present. Then about six weeks after these interventions, I measured legal knowledge post-treatment in each of these three villages. And I should state here that we were not actually measuring retention of legal knowledge. These were separate people we sampled to answer the question each time. So it wasn't as if we were just testing memory. Um, the differences, as you can see on the slide, um, in the control village and the flyer village were not statistically significant. But the difference for the village in which the information was presented by a local leader was significant, and that is what you see behind me, or to my left, or wherever it is on the slide. Um, with accurate legal knowledge in place, whether it comes via observation, or local leader, or some other strategy that I'm not aware of, deterrence can be to work. One hurdle remains, however. Poverty, which is pervasive on both sides of the border in this region, can change the cost benefit calculus built into the deterrence model. The majority of my respondents live on less than a dollar per day and need fuel wood to cook and to heat their homes, especially during the winter. As fuel wood is almost exclusively sourced from protected forests in this region or from community forests and gas is expensive, widespread poverty means that many of those who live in this area and know that wood collection is prohibited in the national park must regularly choose between compliance and meeting their basic needs. In these circumstances, I think it's no surprise that many choose the latter. Indeed, widespread poverty makes one wonder whether this factor can explain cross-border variation in compliance. Here, I examine compliance rates by income level on both sides of the border, as you can see. The compliance rates for those living above the poverty line are higher and significantly so than the compliance rates for those living below the poverty line. But the significant cross-border difference between compliance rates at both high and low income levels suggests that poverty alone cannot explain the cross-border variation in compliance we see near Chitwan and Valmiki. Regu 
Regulatory pragmatism, however, is useful here as well. Because sustainable wood taking is allowed in community forests that provide the poor with an alternative source of uh, fuel wood. Um, allowing those who live near them to both comply with the law, the National Parks Wood Taking Prohibition, and meet their own basic needs. In other words, community forests lower the cost of compliance for those who are motivated to comply to do so. As a result, compliance rates for those living above and below the poverty line are higher when individuals have access to a community forest. And importantly, community forests, as you can see from the, the chart, normalize compliance behavior. The class-based variation in compliance we see in the other slide, I'll just go back there briefly, collapses when we have community forests in play. Okay, let's take a moment to review because I've just laid a lot on the line and I'm about to give you some shadow cases. Um, this is what I have argued thus far. Excuse me. Um, the long and short of it is that if the state designs around known barriers to compliance, it can achieve widespread rule following behavior, even in the absence of significant coercive capacity. In this particular set of cases, the two main barriers were inaccurate legal knowledge and poverty driven noncompliance. The state that adopted a pragmatic strategy for legal knowledge dissemination achieved higher compliance rates. Similarly, when the state adopted a program a pragmatic strategy to lower the cost of compliance for the poor, it realized significant compliance gains. Now, many of you are probably wondering whether this is just a plausible explanation for some one-off anomalous finding. To allay just this fear, I also examined two additional cases drawn from different layers of Indian and Nepali society. The first, as I mentioned earlier, I looked at compliance with teacher-student ratio regulations uh, in private schools in the twin border cities of Rasul Bazar and Bir Ganj, not far from Chitwan and Balmiki. In the second, I examined compliance with child labor regulations in brick kilns located within 10 kilometers of border as it runs from Chitwan and Balmiki in the west to Rasul, just past Rasul Bazar and Bir Ganj. Let's take a brief look at the schools. I conducted a census of all private schools in Rasul Bazar and Bir Ganj. When I examined compliance behavior there, I found that the Indian government's delegation of regulation to parents via the 2009 Right to Education Act, which is essentially a voucher system, allows these interested individuals to enforce ratio regulations by pulling or threatening to pull their children out of schools with high ratios. With this consistent enforcement, I find more accurate legal knowledge among school administrators in India and higher levels of compliance. Let's take a brief look at brick kilns. As I think most of us know, child labor is used extensively in brick kilns in both India and Nepal. Brick kiln workers work long hours in harsh conditions and get paid very little. But they have few alternatives as brick kilns, especially in this region, are one of the only non-agricultural sources of income. I looked at all 54 of them in this region over two long hot summer months, the ones that were located within 10 kilometers of the border that stretches, as I mentioned, from Chitwan and Balmiki in the west to just past Roxel Bazaar and Bir Ganj in the east. As no comprehensive list of all these kilns exists due to low state capacity, I looked, I, I located these kilns using satellite imagery as they leave the very distinctive pattern you see in the rightmost image. So you can almost always see the, um, the stack and the shadow of the stack, it looks a bit like a slab. And you can always see the area around the kiln where workers are clearing away the grass and topsoil to get at the clay underneath. Now, in contrast to the parks and the schools examples, neither India nor Nepal has employed regulatory pragmatism when designing or implementing child labor uh, regulations, and enforcement is inconsistent, as we might expect. Accordingly, I find similarly low levels of legal knowledge and low compliance rates on both sides of the border. So what does all of this mean? In short, regulatory pragmatism does travel. It is not limited to legal knowledge because it explains the amelioration of poverty-driven non-compliance as well. It also works in different regulatory contexts when different actors are involved. The diagram behind me, though seemingly complex, and I'm still working on this, <laughs> fits all of the pieces back together. 
So if you look at the leftmost side of the image, we have inconsistent state action leading to inaccurate legal knowledge. And then that in turn, bar, leads to non-compliance. Um, if you have inconsistent state action paired with regulatory pragmatism, you might get a move, and this is in the center, a move towards potentially accurate legal knowledge. Then there's a question of poverty or no poverty, and then the regulatory pragmatism issue comes up again. If there's poverty plus additional pragmatism to solve that problem, you can actually get compliance. If there's no poverty, you can get compliance right away. If you look entirely at the right side of the image, consistent state action will lead to relatively accurate legal knowledge. If poverty is absent in, in those cases, we get compliance right away. Um, so what's the takeaway? The deterrence model is not wrong. It's just that in areas of state weakness, inaccurate legal knowledge and high levels of poverty can lead to the non-compliance of many who might otherwise be motivated to obey the law. But these barriers can be surpassed. If states allow regulatory pragmatism to guide their legal design and implementation strategies, they can in many cases achieve compliance that is seemingly against the odds. And importantly, because we're talking largely about the developing world here without incurring significant costs. All of this, when taken together, suggests that we as academics need to move beyond coercion and think about the many other capacities that states possess. I will leave it at that. I turn it over to the capable hands of Aaron and also welcome any questions you might have. Um, okay, so, uh, well, actually, I'll start with the last one first. Just the uh, thank you for the comments on the structure of the introduction. I actually just restructured it to remove all of that information. So, <laughs> so it's useful to know that you're looking for it and I can always restructure it again to add a lot of the case description. Um, so why not deal with the compliance literature on common property? The answer to this is actually in many ways empirical um, and perhaps I should be adding it more into the, the literature that I grapple with in the book. I actually did collect data on uh, the cost of penalties uh, associated with non-compliance and the likelihood of detection. And that was what this was supposed to be about. <laughs> um, what I ended up finding was no difference at all I actually expected the buffer zones, which are in place around Chitwan, to have some sort of an effect. And this was what I was sort of expecting to explore. When I got onto the ground, I found a lot of different things happening. And in particular, after quantitative data collection, I found essentially no difference on either side of the border in terms of, and I'll just, um, preface this by saying this is all subjectively understood information. So what the, what the target populations understand the penalties to be, as opposed to what they actually are. And I think the important, it, uh, the distinction is important because when I look at the rules and regulations, they're actually big brackets of what the fines could be associated with a particular case of non-compliance. When you talk to people on the ground about how this works, the state is capricious. So bureaucrats could totally overlook a violation, which regularly happens. They could issue a small penalty, they could issue a larger penalty, or, and I've heard about this happening, you can have bureaucrats telling people that they've violated a regulation that doesn't exist and extracting a penalty from them for that. So there's just massive confusion associated with this. When I ask individuals on the ground, what do you think will happen if you go into the far into the national park and take wood out? What penalty do you perceive? There's no difference on the India and Nepal side of the border. And when I similarly ask them about the likelihood of detection, I find no difference. So the, the explanation that I provide came out of this sort of dead end that I found. I actually, as, as, a, as a lawyer, um, I think that both of these factors, the, the actual cost of the penalty and the likelihood of detection become much more fruitful once people have clarity on the, the legal apparatus. So if they're consistent, if the cost is known, 
And if the likelihood of detection is consistent, suddenly these things work really well. But if some of, if, if one individual can walk by a guard post one day with wood and have absolutely nothing happen in full view of the guard, and the next day that person wants them to pay a fee, it becomes a little bit murkier and they get confused. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so the project grew out of a desire to actually explain the, the sort of economic factors, but balance was so even that I ended up moving on to other, other issues. Um, to what extent are local leaders responding to the rules, um, the consequences, you know, do the consequences of non-compliance vary on each side? I think I've started to explain this. They do vary tremendously, but it's not in a consistent way. Um, it seems to vary with individuals, um, whoever is in the position of enforcement, as opposed to the Indian side is consistently not enforcing, whereas the Nepali side consistently is. If that was happening, I would expect a very different set of, of data coming out, especially amongst those um, who are not connected to the national forest or to the community forest. Um, and if there was consistency, wouldn't this increase knowledge? Yes, there just isn't that much from the actual state actors. Um, there was a question about, is total extraction the same on both sides? And this is really interesting. The, so the population pressure is different on both sides of the park. The population is actually quite a bit higher within 10 kilometers of the park boundary on the Nepal side. So there, um, I forget the exact numbers, but it's it's a good 25 or 30% more people living within that range than living in the, the sort of area right around Balmiki. Um, on the Indian side of the border, individuals also have access to other resources for burning. So there's lots of sugarcane in this area. And unlike on the Nepal side, there isn't sugarcane and, and the, the families, that have at the very least, maybe from working on one of the sugarcane plantations have access to the stocks. They will use that if they can to burn for cooking and heating. Um, so the demand for fuel wood, I would say is higher in Nepal, just because of the population, but also because of the lack of uh, sugarcane to, to use as well. Um, Local leaders, this is one of my favorites. So local leaders, first of all, some of these are in elected positions as leaders of user groups. Some of them are sort of local panchayat heads. Some of them aren't elected to any position at all, but everybody recognizes that this is the person who deals with things in this village. Um, and you can ask people at the local level and they will, everybody will point you to the same person. Um, are they reflecting the state faithfully? No, they're not always doing that. Um, there are some really interesting examples of corruption of the community forest idea. One of my favorites, uh, there's a community forest just outside of Chitwan that has been essentially co-opted by the user group. The locals are not really allowed in and they're running elephant tours uh, for tourists <laughs> of the community forest. And nobody is allowed to, none of the locals are allowed to collect uh, wood in this community forest because it looks bad to the tourists. They don't want to see pe the people actually living how they live in this area. So sometimes it does get co-opted. And I'm not sure how to sort of, I don't think we can completely prevent that. I think if a regulatorily pragmatic stra uh, strategy is in place, the nice thing that it does is it allows the state to focus its limited resources on the egregious non-compliers. So on the Nepal side, I would love to see the Nepali state looking at how community forests are occasionally uh, going wrong and focusing their limited resources on that rather than necessarily focusing on enforcement of national park laws. Um, I'll leave it at that and I will open it up to additional questions or follow up questions from you, Arun. Do you have any follow up questions, uh, Arun? Uh, 
Uh, we have a, a reasonably small group, so we don't have to go to the chat room. You can r raise your digital hand and just go ahead and ask. Uh, any questions? I'm Rick. Um, um, yeah, I'm, Rachel was I'm raising her Rachel. hand physically. Oh, okay. Rachel, Rachel, me. First. So Rachel, Rachel first and then I'm Rick, yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, so, Susan, this is such amazing work, and it's it's really incredible to see all the, you know, leveraging natural experiments and, uh, you know, field experiments and surveys really creatively. Um, and I, so I, I would love to see additional chapters or, you know, if you ever want feedback back on other pieces, I would really, I would love to read it. Um, my, I, so I had two quick questions. And the first is like going back to that, um, uh, diagram that you showed us, like kind of fitting all the pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, my, you know, and, and correct my interpretation if it's wrong, but the way I was reading that was to say, if you think about the initial causal factor, um, that, you know, at the first, the first causal factor is consistency of state action as a driver of how accurate legal knowledge is, and thus whether regulatory pragmatism is possible. And I was just wondering if there is a way in which um, the consistency of state action actually does vary within these states that we think of as, you know, traditionally as being low capacity. Um, but I could imagine uh, cases where when there is a high priority state policy that they do actually marshal their resources, as you were saying that, you know, they could do um, and and ensure that there are, you know, like high sanctions on bureaucrats for a deviate, deviation from consistent compliance. And so I was just curious, on one hand, do you see any kinds of variation there? And it would be, it'd be wonderful to hear more about that. Um, and then my second question was, um, in this set of cases, which is where you're mostly focusing, where state action um, is inconsistent and thus you have uh, you know, inaccurate lo uh, legal knowledge. Um, the first thing I took from it was that there's this heartening case of effectiveness of these delegated enforcement strategies and that, that I, it's, such as the community forest management, um, which seems great. And it, it seems to me a very consistent, powerful story. I was wondering more on the second, which is kind of where Arun was pushing you as well um, on the ways that local leaders can disseminate information. And, um, and so it does sound like you do see some variation as to who is um, elected to head local panchayats as well as other mm -hmm. things. And so I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit more about, you know, the ways in which, you know, under what conditions do mm -hmm. local elected leaders make a difference? Um, and I would love to talk more offline because at least, you know, what I see in my book and, and the related JOP piece is that you do see panchayat leaders intervening with local bureaucrats to force compliance under certain conditions and not <laughs> under many others. And so I'm curious if women's reservations, for example, make a difference there, um, ST reservations make a difference, anything else. Um, and, um, and you know what? it would be great to know more about what those relationships look like. Um, that, that's it, thank you so much, this is great. Susan, would you like to field uh, two, three questions simultaneously and or go one by one? Because we have Emmerich and then we have Thomas Timberg, who's, as I said, a long time student of Bihar, <laughs> Bihar political economy. So well, which way would you like to go? Whichever, whichever way, whichever why way you want. Why don't I go one at a time just because my brain is okay. small and it's okay. Friday. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> I'll forget everything. Um, so um, in terms of consistency, um, it, it varies wildly. Um, one of the things that's most interesting to me about these cases is just um, the degree to which, and, and this is true of almost any state, this is where I'm starting to think about going with my second book project, is that things are inconsistent. Um, they all prioritize amongst different legal projects. When I first started presenting this work, people were really surprised that I was comparing India and Nepal because to them, obviously India was more capable. And that is true, <laughs> which is why I sort of emphasize the locality. Um, when, I, when I first came to this area in 20, 2011, just to give you an example, one of the um, towns that I was working in, a, a little village called Singhai in Bihar in Pashtun Shumharan, um, the, the police station had been bombed by the Maoists. 
and it was collapsed. This big um, sort of concrete structure was collapsed. It had it had been bombed five or six years earlier. It was rebuilt in 2015. Uh -huh. So in terms of just like the presence of the state, the ability to do anything locally was really, really weak here. Now, even going, um, I found at least during that time period, the closer I got to Putna, the better things got. <laughs> um, and the more Putna wanted to, um, became concerned about different issues, the more we got consistency in far-flung areas. Uh, one great example of this is while I was looking at the, the brick kilns on the Bihar side of the border, um, a couple of people were reluctant to speak to me. And these were the people who were located much closer to main roads. And they didn't want to give an interview. So I said, that's fine. You don't have to fill out the survey. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you're concerned about? And what they described was the fact that if there's ever some issue with child labor in brick kilns, what happens is the government in Patna sends out somebody in a vehicle with a, you know, a lal bati on the, on the top. And that person makes a big deal out of intervening in some place that's really close to the road and making a show with the hope that other people will maybe, maybe fall in line. I'm not sure they're even trying to do that much. They're just trying to seem responsible. Uh, so you get this wild inconsistency, quite a bit of capability when there's political efficacy behind it, but otherwise not so much on a regular basis. Um, as to local leaders, Almost everything I can say is anecdotal. I wish I understood what was, I, I think this is an incredibly fruitful area for research. The best that I could tell um, was that there was a lot of intrinsic motivation. Some of these folk really wanted to help the local community. Some of them couldn't care less. Um, some of them, it was extractive. Others, there was something positive going on there. Um, even for those for whom it was a positive relationship, one of the things that I found was that it was important. Um, these people liked being important people. Um, and the locals would not sort of treat them as well if it was clear to the locals that this person was behaving in a way that was undermining their interests. Um, often an alternative leader would crop up, maybe not somebody who's even elected, but people would go to that person for their problems. And potentially if, if the original one was elected, the election might shift. And um, that's just my anecdotal observation. I wasn't really researching it. I am working on, um, along with Gilles, I'm working on, um, we're looking at women Sarpanches in Haryana, and that has been fun. There's all sorts of fascinating huh. things that women do at the local at the local level in Haryana. When I properly have data to share on that, um, I will I will definitely comment more. So thank all you right. so much. Emmerich uh, next, and then we'll go to Thomas. Yeah. Yeah, Emmerich. Um, thank you, Ashu, and uh, thank you, Susan, for the presentation. Thank you, Arun, for, for, for the discussion uh, remarks. Um, to, to echo Rachel, um, really, really appreciated um, the, the empirical design, the cross-border controlled comparison, um, and the multiple ways of gathering out of evidence. This is fantastic. Um, and further, I was I was super excited to hear about your your shadow cases. Um, so I work on the politics of education in South Asia, um, and beyond that, my partner actually works on environmental regulation of brick kilns in South Asia. Um, so this just brought our <laughs> yeah, we just brought our household together. In this talk. Um, so my my questions are are, are around this. Mm -hmm. Um, the first question is is about the role that markets are playing, um, mm -hmm. and um, so so you you have this nice model of of two actors, state and society, mm -hmm. um, but there are also markets involved um, through uh, both the um, uh, wood collection and um, schools and brick kilns, right? Um, and um, in schools in India, uh, there's a nice exit option, right? Um, if you don't comply, you just go to a different school. Um, in Nepal, there's a nice exit option. Um, you don't necessarily have to go to, um, uh, 
uh, not comply with the state, there are community managed forests that you can uh, use. Um, and in brick kilns, brick kilns are monopsonists in the labor market. Uh, there's nowhere else and, and there's no regulation there. Um, so how much of this is just explained by the fact that there are functional markets um, rather than, um, uh, as, as you say, regu regulatory pragmatism? Um, then the second question is about um, the one dimensionality of compliance. So um, there are a lot of things to comply with, right? There is um, on the environmental side, it's um, wood collection, but it's also, I don't know, littering in the forest, mm -hmm. hunting in the forest, many other things that you can do uh, in forests. Um, in schools, one of the things that strikes me about school markets in India is that the private school operators um, regularly do not comply with the many regulations of the Indian state. Yeah. Um, puts upon them, not mm -hmm. just pupil teacher ratios, but whether you have a playground, how much you pay teachers, um, and bathrooms. yeah, <laughs> bathrooms for, for, <laughs> for girls. Um, with brick kilns, um, it's not only just child labor, but it's where the brick kiln is built, mm -hmm. how the brick kiln is built, um, and a bunch of other things uh, about brick kilns. So what does compliance look across the spectrum of the various things that you, can ha you have to comply with in brick kilns and schools? Um, and uh, with environmental regulations. Excellent, thank you for the fantastic questions. Um, markets are sort of hanging out in the background of all of this. Um, so um, functional markets, there's really interesting things going on with the schools example. Um, on both sides of the border, there's a fairly robust market for private education. That is why I chose to focus on private schools. Um, what I found was that the thumb on the scale in terms of the Right to Education Act and giving poorer families some money that they could take with them made a difference in the sense that more people could move. Previously, a lot of people below a certain level had very little ability to exit. So the, the Right to Education Act is just a little bit of a thumb that allows more people to do it. Interestingly, in terms of compliance in schools, my data suggests that the schools least likely to comply are the fanciest ones. Um, <laughs> so the places where I found completely packed classrooms were the most expensive schools in Roxel Bazaar and Beer Gunch. This is your Delhi public school, et cetera, right? Um, and the, the headmasters, principals of these schools were pretty much indignant in terms of compliance, what they said, was things like, we get our students into the proper colleges, the parents don't care, right? Um, and not only that, but the state knows that we're doing an okay job, so they're not gonna get us into trouble either. They just were utterly unconcerned about compliance. I mean, and, and would say it to, to my face. Um, in terms of the brick kilns, there are some interesting market effects as well. So, um, I found that those brick kilns that were located, let's just say the structural factor, factors associated with a brick kiln are unique. And brick kilns that are located closer to a main town where they can sell the bricks, um, as well as brick kilns that are located on ground that has better clay. So the color of the bricks matters a lot in terms of the price that it can fetch in the market. Um, the redder the brick, the better. They're supposed to be stronger. I do not understand this, but this is the colloquial understanding. Um, and the price varies tremendously. So you can go from four rupees to seven rupees, depending upon the color. Now, child labor, much more likely to be found in brick kilns that are further from the market, such that they have more transport costs, and in kilns that have worse clay quality, so they fetch lower prices. Uh, for their bricks. There's definitely market factors going on on both sides of the border. I talk about it in the book, in the chapters, to sort of explain that there are a lot of dynamics, but I still find this variation. Um, or in the case of the brick kilns, I still find no variation in compliance. Um, in terms of one-dimensional compliance, I had to choose something. Um, I was specifically, in the case of the school's examples, there are lots of ways, and I will say that the wealthier, the wealthier schools in Rossel Bazaar and Birganj 
were complying quite well in some ways and not in others. I chose the teacher student ratio regulation because it was easily observable without my asking. Um, I did not want to be alerting um, the, the people in the school that I was observing their compliance with regulations. And this was the easiest thing that I could possibly do. It was also one of the few things that was identical on each side of the border, which allowed for the comparison. So there are a lot of a lot more regulations in place in India, very specific regulations about playgrounds and women's bathrooms and all these other things. They weren't matched on the Nepal side, so I couldn't necessarily compare them. Um, the overall picture of compliance that I got in schools in India was a bit better. I'll just say that. Um, and I, that may be right to education act. That may be more money. That might be all sorts of other things. I can only really speak to the data on that particular one. All right, Tom, you're next. Tom, Tom Timberg. Um, Hi, Tom. Are you in Washington? Picking... Washington or Bihar? I'm uh, in Washington. Hi. Okay. Um, the thing that most struck me was you're uh, looking at the border and it occurs to me that there's enormous literature mm. on the border between India and Bangladesh. Mm. Actually, probably some I don't know about between India and Nepal and so forth, and Bhutan, but partially because there's literature going back to the 19th century on mm -hmm. these links, but also uh, because of a great deal of international interest in uh, promoting transport and goods flows uh, throughout the region. And there's a, you know, billions of dollars of World Bank and other money going to that. Therefore, they funded a lot of such studies. Have you looked at any of that? So the answer is just a little bit. Um, early on, I considered, um, one of the things I was considering looking at after I, or when I was conceiving of this project, early on, it was an environmental project. And I was looking for other cases that might be similar that I could look at. And I'm forgetting the name of the national park that basically exists right on, um, what is it, Sundarban? Is it? Um, there's a national park right on the Bangladesh-India border um, that is in many ways similar to Sichuan and Balmiki uh, in the way it's situated. And I thought about trying to compare um, some of the compliance there just to get some diversity. I was well, also the... thinking, come again? The romantic place to look at, of course, would be the cinder ponds, yeah. uh, where where there is a there is indeed a lot of environmental regulation on both sides, very different regulation and very different, um, uh, if you will, uh, applications. I was involved in the early '80s in mm -hmm. a major comparative study that got a lot of people both in, well, both in Bangladesh and India. It was sponsored for various reasons by the Smithsonian. I would but love I, to look into it more, and I would love to go someday <laughs> when we can move around again. Um, I, I can tell you that I definitely considered uh, that, and actually there are a couple of situations uh, on the Indian-Nepal border near Uttarkhand um, that I also considered just in terms of trying to, when I was pursuing the environmental idea, just environment alone, that was the way I was thinking about the project. But when I sort of realized that there was something else interesting that was going on, I decided to branch out instead, just within the same area to sort of different layers of society to try to get organizations and businesses um, involved and to see if compliance varied when I really dramatically changed things. And so that was that was the logic, but I would, uh, I would love to work on Sundarbans and I would, really enjoy hearing more about it from you or others. Uh, Shivaji, are you, are you, you, it seems like you're, you're sitting uh, in a, uh, in the lobby of a five-star hotel in, in, in Toronto. Are you in Toronto? Are you in New Haven? Where are you? No, no I'm in Toronto. Okay. Uh, okay. Do, you have a, do you have a thought? Do you have a question? Do you have a comment? Um, no, no, the background is the robots library, where I haven't been for more than a year. Oh. <laughs> oh, this is a library. Why? It sounds it, it, to all, all of us to all of us looking like a five star hotel in downtown Toronto. But anyway, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Uh, no, Any thoughts? Have, um, like one thought I have is like, oh, you, when you're setting up the puzzle, like the Indian state is stronger in terms of capacity versus the Nepali state. I was wondering, like, you're comparing Bihar with Nepal. And the example you gave is like 
there's a police station which was bombed and it's still not. So I was wondering whether actually the the particular Indian state you're choosing is not necessarily much stronger or maybe even weaker in terms of certain kinds of state capacity as compared to Nepal. Uh, and also, do you have any like uh, like anecdotal or qualitative interviews with the actual forest officers or police officers on both sides and why they thought that there's a difference or do they have any comparative perspective on why there's a variation between these two sides of the body? Excellent question. Um... So it's true that on the Nepal side of the border, I never saw a bombed out police station. It's also true that not that long before the start of this project, there was separate Maoist violence on both sides of the border. Um, there's all sorts of interesting illegal activity along that border. It's, it's quite interesting, rice smuggling, all sorts of things. Um, what I would say is that in some cases, with respect to some things, the Nepali state can be a little bit more capable in this area. Um, it's not perfect in terms of um, the comparison. What I will say is that in terms of the perceptions of residents in the area, it's about equal. They don't, in terms of the factors that I was talking about earlier, likelihood of detection of non-compliance, they don't see any difference. Um, they're not judging the Nepali state to be more capable in that regard. Um, and, um, oh, sorry, there was one other thing. I just completely lost it. The well, police you... officers. Ah, yes. The police officers and forest officers. Yes, so I will tell you, I do have interviews. Um, and this entire project started uh, because of a conversation with I think it was the assistant warden at Chitwan National Park. I was thinking about working on Medesi politics. And um, I, this is very serendipitous. Uh, a good friend who's German had said that she very much wanted to come along with me to Nepal at some point. I think she thought that all of Nepal was mountainous. <laughs> I told her to come along. Um, when I took her to the south of Nepal, she was not particularly impressed because she thought we were going to the Himalaya. Um, I <laughs> decided that I needed, you know, I said, I'm going to be working, you can come along, but she was profoundly bored. So I said, okay, I'm going to send her into Chitwan for the day on an elephant and I'm going to go work on my work. <laughs> <laughs> I did that and I walked away from that location and I passed a map and that map had Chitwan National Park and Valmiki National Park on it. And it was the map itself that literally launched this project because I looked at it and I thought, oh, fascinating. There's another park right across the border. And instead of going and talking to the Medesi folk who I was supposed to talk to that day, I walked down to the park headquarters and I said, hi, I realize I'm a random person off the street, but I wanted to talk to somebody about the parks. And I had eventually, after many cups of tea, I did speak to the assistant warden. He said some really interesting things. Um, I said, you know, how is it going essentially? How are these parks working out? And he said, oh, it's going okay. You know, we don't have many resources, but we make do with what we can, blah, blah, blah. And I said, how about this uh, park that's just across, Bamiki? And he said, oh, it's interesting. We've just, and this is 2011, we've just started talking to them. So we now, they now actually have joint meetings across the border in which they strategize um, about things that work and things that don't. And he was the one who first made the observation to me that they have a wood collection problem over there. And people are going in and doing this all the time. And I said to him, why do you think that is? And he basically said, I don't know. <laughs> um, and that was, one thing that sort of stuck in the back of my mind in terms of, but of course he's the head of the national park. He's not sort of head of the Ministry of Forestry thinking about um, community forests, et cetera. Um, he, didn't, he didn't have an opinion at that point. Um, when I talk to forest officers, they are often locals um, who have been conscripted into a position where that's often awkward. Um, they're supposed to get other people into trouble for <laughs> collecting wood in the forest, right? Now, 
sometimes they're posted in places where they don't really know people. Um, and on average, I would say that they, you know, the, the conversations that I had, they were very sympathetic to people's needs. I'll say that. Um, they didn't feel strongly compelled to enforce the non-collection of wood prohibition. Some of them did, obviously, um, because plenty of my respondents said that they had gotten into trouble, but they were um, mindful of exactly the position of individuals. All right, it's time to bring this to a close. Uh, Eric, we, we're meeting in two weeks again, I think, something like that. So uh, we, the last meeting uh, will take place of the seminar this semester in two weeks, and Americ will host that, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, April okay. 9th, uh, we'll April, have Tanner Sri Goyal. Tanner Sri Goyal on April 9th. Uh, see you all then. Uh, thank, thank you for you. joining us.